what I decided to try to do was first to, to make a sort of a wake-up call. Um, and this is off topic for, uh, from the talk itself. The talk is about uh, Fourier analysis and, and <coughs> stuff you can, well, hopefully uh, a, a new angle or maybe some, some incitement to think about um, frequency domain processing in a particular kind of way. But the um, topic has come up a, little, a lot in this conference, actually, about uh, playability and, and musical instruments. So I thought I should uh, dust off my latest musical instrument and show it to you. Um, it consists of a leap controller, which is a thing that, um, thing that tells the computer down to, I believe, millimeter accuracy where all the joints of your hand are, which is 57 numbers. And then you can map them any way you want. Um, what I have done is um, map them to three coupled oscillators, a little bit like the old boucle synths, the, uh, but all three trying to sync each other, uh, which looks like a flow on a three-dimensional manifold in a way. Uh, and then you get to change the shape of the manifold, which of course maps rather nicely to changing the shape of your hand. So you get a sort of a hand gesture to timbre converter. Right? Um, and, and, the, and the best thing about when you couple oscillators like that is you have no idea what they're going to do. It's like, it's like trying to play a violin. Um, and so... Um, Tell you with, uh, one more thing about that. Um, it took me a long time to think about how to convert a hand gesture to into anything useful mathematically. And uh, I mean, the thing is, you cannot actually control all 57 coordinates independently. And the thing that uh, finally occurred to me is, first off, do not um, do not make the position of your hand mean anything. So don't make the performer do this, because it looks stupid and it's hard to do it fast. So what you want to do is make the performer do this, which you can do fast and, and very accurately. <coughs> Um, so, uh, so everything is, is invariant, almost invariant with respect to, to rotation and to translation. The only th thing that I cheated on was I fixed uh, the angle of the horizontal plane of the thumb to be, or of the palm, to be volume so that I can at least have a nice volume control. But other than that, position and attitude mean nothing. And what, does, what it does use is this. Um, conceptually, you stretch a triangle from, uh, from tip of thumb to knuckle to pinky, another triangle from tip of index finger to index knuckle to wrist, another triangle from this fingertip to this knuckle to wrist. Each of those three triangles, you get about three free parameters of, of shape, of which I only use two, in fact. I use the, you know, there are two vectors that make the triangle, and I use just the dot product and the cross product, which you can then easily change around sort of two-dimensionally just by doing that kind of thing. Right, so dot product is this and cross product is that, right? Same thing with this and same thing with that. And the other two fingers, you know, they're basically going to follow around because you don't really, it, it's really hard to do these two fingers independently, as a pianist will tell you. And, and so maybe you could get up to four of these kind of triangles. So just imagine this, this structure of triangles in space that you, can, that you can deform. And that turns out to map very, very well to uh, the idea of three coupled oscillators because you can have the shape of the triangle be the, the oscillator's own natural speed and the strength of coupling to the other two or something like that. And then you can try to play the sucker. And that's the interesting part because um, hopefully you can actually learn how to play this in a sense. <laughs> but I have yet to get it to the point where I can actually scratch out Mary had a little lamb on it, which is my sort of test of whether you, you, know, whether you actually know what an instrument's going to do when you reach out. You know, can you actually play A? And the answer is, let's see, where's A? No, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> it won't work. 
what'll happen is it'll, I'll scoop it up toward A and then it'll jump off to some other place because it'll find a different limit cycle. And, and then it will just basically fool me. And so what, what it really is is a sort of a, a, a titanic contest between musician and instrument where the instrument refuses to do what the musician wants to do. And the, of course the musician wants the, you know, is refusing to go along just blithely with what the instrument wants to do either. And so then you get this sort of um, tug of war that, that, that seems to me to be musically interesting. Um, so that's what I do for fun. And, well, I do things like that for fun. This is, this is one example. And um, uh, it turns out that, as Max says, the, um, uh, the, the fastest bit rate you can get out of a human, Max said, the fastest rate you can get out of a human is, uh, let's see, the uh, articulators of your, of your vocal tract, which is to say your tongue and, and the rest of your vocal cavity, and the, uh, finger, your fingertips, which you can type with or something like that. There are lots of instruments that you can play with your fingertips, but it seems like the computer, and fin the fingertip to computer interface is, is an interesting thing that still has a lot of room for, for interesting work in. Oh, by the way, if you're interested in, in haptic stuff, you don't need haptics. Just don't, don't bother. I mean, you, they're expensive and they're clunky and they're not very portable and you should just do things in the air instead because you really get total control that way. And, the, and, the, and there is already haptic just in the fact that you have to stretch your muscles to get your fingers to where they are. So, don't, so don't, don't do the thing with the solenoids. Anyway, the thing will you know, go unstable and break your hand, so you don't want that either. Um, and, and then the other thing that, uh, that I've been, I started working with Trevor uh, on this 30 years ago and have been trying ever since to make, this, make sense of this. Um, there ought to be some, some kind of speech or, or vocal utterance to joystick conversion. Right? You ought to be able to put a microphone up to Trevor, say, who's a, who's a fabulous uh, singer if you can call it singer, vocalist, and, um, and g take, the, take that stream of information and turn it into a uh, control over some kind of synthetic instrument. And you would have an amazing thing to, to play with then, or Trevor would, anyway. Um, and uh, I, not there yet, although uh, a, a current graduate student, Tina Talon, is working on that right now. So we might be somewhere, we might be somewhere in a couple of years. Who, who knows? Uh, uh, our understanding of what, what the problem might be and how you might do it is, is, has been improving with time. So one of these days, we'll have a really cool voice control instrument to show you in, in this kind of a context. Not yet. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so that's, that, that's how to have fun with computers. Um, make, make funny noises come out of speakers. Oh, I got to, I got to thank uh, Stefan for putting really good speakers up. And that was my incitement to do this because, <laughs> because <laughs> I've been listening to these speakers all weekend wanting to put my sounds through these speakers. So, <laughs> So that's, what's, that's what that's about. Um, all right, so I'm going to stop this and start to tell you more serious stuff that, uh, that is actually what you want to find out about, which is um, you know, scientific nonsense. Um, oh, um, first uh, off, off to or slightly off topic thing. This is a URL which will get you a zip file of everything that I'm going to use today. And if you want it, you're welcome to it. It's not commented or anything like that, so you're going to just have to watch me use it if you want to try it yourself and see what these things mean. But I believe we're being taped, so you can then look at the tape, figure out how to use it, and then download it and, and check it out. Um, there's, there are no, um, what's the right word? There are no secrets here. In fact, there might not even be anything that works. Um, now, um, the topic of the talk is this. Um, this, this is something that um, people who know, this is something that people who use FFTs or, or frequency domain stuff in general uh, already know perfectly well, which is that uh, no matter what you do when you're doing a short time Fourier transform, you're, you're windowing something. And depending on what the window is, yeah, Julius is looking like he doesn't like this, which is, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why Julius doesn't like this in a second, but. Um, um, what, what you see on the, on the left hand is, is various kinds of windows, and on the right hand what you see is the Fourier transform of the various kinds of windows. Now the, now the reason Julia shouldn't like this is because actually that one hat should look like a cinch function, but if you just look at it at the integer points that an FFT analysis would give you, actually the cinch function goes through zero in all those points, so you don't see all the, all the groovy sidebands. But don't worry, we'll, we'll see the groovy sidebands later because you'll see, it'll happen. Um, and then you apply various kinds of windows. My favorite window in the world is the Han window. Uh, because it's got this real simple Fourier transform. And then the um, observation is that if you want to apply a Hahn window to a, 
to, to a signal that you're analyzing, right? So grab, grab two to the end samples of it somewhere. Take the, just take the raw Fourier transform of that, and then if you want the Han windowed Fourier transform of it instead of the raw one, you can apply the Han window a posteriori by simply convolving the, the numbers that you get out of the raw unwindowed FFT with the number minus a half, uh, sorry, the number positive a half, and then to the left and right of it, minus one quarter. So that looks like the Fourier transform of the Han window. Uh, two details, um, uh, just to confuse you. Um, why are the signs alternating between positive and negative? It's because um, the way most DSP Fourier transforms work is they put zero at the very beginning of the window. Um, if you put zero in the middle of the window, kind of where Fourier thought it belonged, then this thing looks a lot nicer because everything is pointing in the same direction. Everything looks like it has zero phase. But a, but a cosine whose peak is in the middle of a, of a window, if you use the uh, uh, standard FFT, actually looks like a negative amplitude because the peak should be at the, at the ends, which is right where you wish they wouldn't be because that's right where you're wrapping around. So this is, that will be confusing and the confusion will never go away and you will, um, and you will just always be confused about this, especially because some of the literature um, uh, has, it in, has zero in the middle and some has it on the side. And it's worse than that when you start making the window travel because some people believe that the window should leapfrog and other engineers do. And musicians believe that the window should slide. And so, uh, so I'm doing sliding window because I'm operating in real time and that's an easier way to think about real time. But that will confuse you too because it's not going to line up with the literature if you read engineering literature. So I'm sorry about this. You're just going to, this, this is going to come back and bite you many times in your life and uh, it's, as it has me. And just, just learn, to, learn to enjoy the confusion. Because if you, I guess if you don't enjoy being confused, then you're just not going to have a very happy life. So <laughs> um, now if you, this is not quite true, but, um, but it's almost true. Um, the, the, the second line down is actually an exact relationship. The, um, the third line down is, why don't you just pinch the Han window so that it only occupies the middle half of the, of the window that you're looking at, right? Well, then the Fourier transform of that is almost what I drew up, which is, um, uh, again, it's alternating in sign for the usual reason. But if you look at the, uh, at the middle peak, let's see, does the mouse show up there? Yes. If you look at the middle peak and these two side peaks, you see what, what you saw there, except that it's wrapped around, uh, except that it's phased differently because it's stretched out twice as big. Actually, what's going, well, no, I'm not going to say that. Um, I could confuse you more, but let's not. Um, and then what you see is, a, uh, is, a, uh, is essentially the, the frequency domain picture of, of what a Han window looks like, which goes down to zero at four, well, in, in, at that amount of stretch, it goes to zero at four bins to the right and four bins to the left of the peak. Whereas in the one above, it, it goes to zero. You don't see it, but it goes to zero at two bins to the right and two bins to the left of the peak. Okay? Sorry, I know a lot of you know all this stuff very well, but I have to repeat it all the time because it gets very, well, you will get confused. I'll find, I'll find a way to get you confused about this um, pretty soon. And then, um, of course, if you do something like translate the, uh, so I call that window E prime. I'm using the word E because I'm going to pretend these are basis vectors, which they're not. But later on, they'll, they'll be vectors anyway. Um, and at uh, and the bottom, uh, I'm just showing you, if, if you slide the, the place in the window that you're looking at, that has a perfectly good Fourier transform too, and it just looks akimbo. So what I tried to draw at, at, the, at the bottom is um, pretend that this, this is still frequency here. I didn't tell you what the axes were, I'm sorry. <laughs> the axis, uh, the, the horizontal axis is time uh, on the left and frequency on the right, and, and vertical axis is amplitude. Um, and here, the amplitudes are complex numbers, so I'm pretending that the imaginary axis is pointing toward and away from you, and the real axis is pointing up and down. So what happens is, uh, and, and here you can actually see better what really this thing looks like if you look between the integers. It looks like a corkscrew, and the corkscrew just, just winds at, at different rate, at different, you can't call it a rate because that's frequency. It winds tighter or looser depending on where you stuck the window kernel in some, in some way. That's not a really good explanation, but that's the best thing I could try to do. All right, and now the observation is the following. Well, what you can do is you can uh, take a, an unwindowed Fourier transform of anything that you like, any, any signal in the time domain that you like, or you can make one up, what, uh, make a spectrum up even. And then you can start saying things like, well, if I want to look at what the thing would look like at the first 
quarter of the, uh, sorry, the first half of the window or the middle half of the window or the last half of the window. All I've got to do is apply, uh, convolve or dot uh, the, uh, the spectrum that I'm looking at with whatever window kernel I, I want in the frequency domain. And then I can be talking about what is happening at different times in the time domain by thinking about it in the frequency domain as a direction. That's to say this thing here, however stupid it looks, it's, it's a perfectly good vector in, in, in the vector space of all possible spectra. And so it points somewhere, and you can make something point that where that place harder or softer, and that would be changing the, uh, the, the signal in that frequency range, but also in that uh, place in time. All right, is this clear? Okay, good. I'll, I'll, I'll confuse you anyway later. Um, now, this makes it seem like we are somehow getting around the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And of course, you, you will never get around the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And so what I'll try to do is tell you why this doesn't actually really give you total control over everything that you might wish for. Um, and I think the way to do that is to start pretending that things are actually vectors and show you a vector picture. So, um, so here, yeah, I even named it vectors, how nice. All right. Here's a picture in, oh my God, no, let's not, I don't want to show you that. There, that's, here's a, here's a representation of, that other thing is an aside, which I'll come back to. Here's a, um, here's a representation of how you might think about a, a, time, a function of time or just a function, because whether it's time or frequency just depends on what basis you're looking at it in, right? So I'm calling this function f or f hat, depending on um, whether you're, you're looking at it in the time basis or the frequency basis. So it just looks like a vector. Actually, it looks like a vector over here, too, somehow. But I'm pretending, it's, I'm pretending it only looks like a vector in the frequency domain, which is artificial. And then uh, my claim is that you could now take that and change it E-ishly. That's to say, change it according to the window kernel that I am marking E, which, I'm sorry, was E prime before, but I got sick of the prime, so I dropped it here. Um, so it's now E. And, um, and well, it's, well, it's a vector too. Uh, so you could, for instance, take F and move it in the direction of E, or actually E Fourier transform now. So what you're looking at here is the, I, I'm, correct my linear algebra if this is wrong. I just, I just wrote this down without actually really checking it. But here's F, and here's my attempt to, to project F onto the vector E, or then put hats over everything, right? Because that's, but that's just a basis, right? So what I'm doing is projecting f down to the vector e, which is telling me um, how much e-ishness there is in f. And what e is is not just that window kernel, but, but that window kernel at a particular frequency. So what it really would look like as a vector is that window kernel, but spiraling along at whatever frequency we're interested in looking at. And so, and so we would be looking both at some particular frequency that I'm not drawing and also at some particular time range. And then if I want to do something to the spectrum that only sits inside the region that e describes, all I got to do is move in the E direction, which is to say I could take F, and if I don't like the amplitude of F at a particular frequency in the middle of the window, I could take a multiple of E hat here and just add it to F hat. And depending on how much of it I add, I make this vector longer or shorter, and then I correct the amplitude of F. Uh, in the direction E. Right? Now, a, a small detail. Uh, it's, uh, you want this to be a real number, not a, not a non-real number, because you don't want to change the phase of F. Uh, well, sometimes you do, but, uh, but for, most, for most applications that you could imagine, like, for instance, the Griffin and Lim algorithm, you're really changing amplitudes and not phase. So what you'd like to be able to do is push, uh, is push F in its own direction in the direction of E. And by that, I mean push it in the direction of E, but phased in such a way that, um, that F, that, phased in such a way that it points in the direction of F's projection onto E, right? So F projected onto E is not just, an, is not just a real amplitude, but it's a complex amplitude. There's, there's also the phase in at which E uh, hits F. And you want to, and, and, and if you're just changing amplitude, you want to maintain that phase, which, which you do by, uh, by adding some multiple of this 
dot product times E tilde because that dot product, I believe, has the right phase for just being F-ish. All right? Okay, so it sounds like you can do anything that you want. And unfortunately, you can't. And the reason you can't is because, um, so there's going to be an E for every possible frequency. But those E's are not linearly independent. The reason being that all of those E's have a support that's only half the size of F, so the dimensionality of, every, of all the possible things that look like that is only N over 2 if, if capital N is the size of the window. And so what you've got is, is these vectors that are pretending to be a basis, but actually they're only spanning half of the thing. So if you, if you bash one of them, then you're, uh, then you're actually bashing it in the direct. You can't do that without bashing it in the directions of others as well. And so therefore, there's some complicated set of constraints that, uh, that governs how well you can actually get F to behave in all the directions that are described by E. And that is a thing which I don't have a very good way to conceptualize for you, except to say something a little bit sloppy, which is this. Um, if you... Um, if you reverse what you think of as time and what you think of as frequency, think of the left-hand side as frequency, then, then E is, talk, is band limited to only half of the Nyquist. And therefore, in some sense, the collection of all E's over here is looking like, a, uh, is looking like it's oversampled by a factor of two. So whatever you do to the E's over there, you're doing it in a way that, uh, that should be band limited. Right. In other words, if you think about all the, all the all the projections of, of f onto all the various e's, you only have n over two possible ones that you can affect and not n. And really, you, if you're thinking about critical sampling, you could actually do every other one. But actually, in practice, it doesn't work that well because they still fight with each other because, you know, cinch functions and everything. So uh, it's going to be a mess. What Griffin and Lim do, okay, so. So, the, so the, uh, the, the thing I wanted to start with was, oh, Griffin and Lim have this great idea. Why don't we, um, um, make a thing with a desired amplitude spectrum. We don't, we don't uh, know what the phases are going to be, but we know that we, ha that we want a, um, uh, a, a specified short time amplitude spectrum, uh, although the signal itself will evolve in time, and so we have some, we have some sonogram that we've made up, like just drawn on, on, on a piece of paper, and now we want to realize a sound that has that sonogram. Right? That's the Griffin and Lim problem. Actually, that's the second half of the paper, which is the cool half. Right? Um, and the way you do it, um, I'll just tell you how you do it. I, I actually made a PD patch to do it, but I'm scared to show it to you. Um, the way you do it is you just, um, you just throw anything down that you want to start with, and then you synthesize it, and gee, it's wrong. And how do you know it's wrong? Well, you take the amplitude spectrum and it's wrong, so then you just apply, you just change all the amplitudes, scaling without changing the phases, right? So just change the uh, scalar magnitudes, and then resynthesize, and you'll get something closer. But it won't be right, again, because, because windows overlap, and so their phases will, will fight with each other, and then you'll go back into the frequency domain, and it'll be wrong again. But just fix it. Just, fi just, just filter it repeatedly. Filter, resynthesize, analyze, filter, resynthesize, analyze, and so on. And eventually, Griffin will improve that that, uh, that, that uh, process will converge on the, uh, on the optimal time domain signal that, that has the closest thing that you can get to that particular amplitude spectrum. It's a cool paper. Um, and it's paywalled. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> you still can't seem to get it. Um, I had to use my library card to get it. And it really makes me angry when that happens. So, um, <laughs> so when, you, when you publish something, uh, regardless of what the journal wants you to do, just put it up on the web. And, and people will, will actually read it then, <laughs> which, which you presumably want, right? It's just your journal editors that, or your journal, whatever you call managers that don't want people reading your stuff. Uh, everyone else wants you to, you know, everyone else wants the information to flow. All right, so, um, all right, so that's Griffin and Lim. So if you're doing something like that, what you're trying to do is, is alter the amplitudes of, of, of spectra in order to get desirable properties on the, on the sort of theory that actually it's that amplitude spectrum that you hear, right? Unfortunately, when you actually do Griffin and Lim, uh, to try to say time stretch a signal, it doesn't turn out to be the right problem. Um, it's not the case that the best time stretched signal is the one who's, say, uh, so the toy problem, or, or actually the sort of generating problem is, I want to just take this 
thing recording and time stretch it by a factor of two, right? So obviously what you should do is look at the amplitude spectrum and make there be something that's twice as long that has an amplitude spectrum that's maximally like the amplitude spectrum of the shorter one, and then f work out the phases so that it works. And when you do that, it sounds like you're listening through a roll of paper or something. And I don't know how to explain what the, what the wrongness is of the sound, but it's, it sounds oddly metallic or kazoo, pa pass through a kazoo or something like that. It's just, it's just not quite that. So the whole premise of my paper when I, uh, when I thought about what I was trying to do uh, turned out to kind of be ill-conceived. So I'm not going to do that. So the abstract is wrong. Um, but nonetheless, if, um, nonetheless, if you can think of uh, a good way to, f to specify a signal by amplitude spectrum, which might be something, well, I won't go into what it might be, but uh, I've been thinking about it and I'm realizing that I don't know the answer, so there's, there's something to fiddle with there. At any rate, if you, if you do have some idea about how you want amplitude spectra to work on different time scales simultaneously, which is, a, which is a thing that you would like to be able to do in frequency domain because you're never in the right place in the trade-off for everything that's going on in a signal. Well, maybe this is, a, maybe this is an approach to, that, that would allow you at least to formulate problems and, and, and optimize solutions to those kinds of problems. All right. so, uh, so, so, so the general thing that I'm trying to, to incite is Get, take, a, take a signal and look at it in the frequency domain and using all of these wonderful uh, vectors, which are, which are directions, uh, be, be able to edit what the signal is doing or, or be able to aim for having the signal do things that you specify on, on time ranges, on, on separate time frames simultaneously and, and then make that an optimization problem. That seems like that's a, that's a procedure that, that is interesting and, and could get you somewhere cool. So, uh, so that is my incitement of the day. Um, now, as an aside, as if everything here wasn't an aside, uh, here's an aside. Um, you can, um, sorry about this, I tried, I tried very hard to make a picture that actually represents what this is and I couldn't do it. Um, suppose you want to know uh, what the frequency of a, of a component of a signal is and you don't feel like taking two Fourier transforms at different, at, 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 at different times and subtracting phases the way the phase vocoder measures frequency, right? Um, I, someone here probably knows this. I think it is the case that the best way to, to get frequencies of sinusoidal components of sound is, is by measuring phase change with a sliding window. Um, there are other things that you could think of doing, like looking at the peak and, and, pat, and trying to fit a cinch function to it, but um, but it's it, at, least the, at least the method that I know of that seems to work the best is, is the phase change method, right? And the phase change method you can do um, with only one Fourier transform. And the way you do it is this. You apply the Hahn window a posteriori. So you take a rectangular windowed Fourier transform. And then, and then you apply two Hahn windows, that uh, one of which is slid over one sample from the other one. Now, this makes people angry because um, that one sample slide is such an infinitesimal change in time that how could you expect to, to measure the phase change uh, reliably with that? But um, I claim that actually that's not so bad because if you compare that to the usual thing that people do, which is maybe advance like an eighth of a window, which is you know n over eight samples, you actually made the window bigger. So really you should compare this hop one thing to a hop, to a smaller window with a bigger hop. And then if you look at it that way, uh, it doesn't actually fare so badly at all. If you, work, if you crunch the numbers, you, you, it's, it's not bad. It's not, you, it's, it actually is, is optimal if you, if you pretend it's a sinusoidal noise, unbelievably. But no one ever has a sinusoidal noise. But at any, at any rate, for real situations, it's, it's pretty, pretty near as good as, as the ordinary sliding window method. And, um, and so what you do is you just apply the two windows, and, and what, what of course happens when you slide the window is you knock the phase, okay, so what, what I'm trying to do here is show you what the kernel looks like, the, the, the Fourier transform of those two Han windows that are one sample off. What happens is, at least if, if uh, once, you've, once, you've, once you've thought about phase and gotten, it to, gotten them to agree in the, in the middle uh, bin, right, uh, then one bin to the right and one bin to the left, um, they just knock, knock forward and backward um, you know, one over two pi in cycles. And so you can, uh, and so really what you're interested in is 
if you just change the Hahn window by these, these incremental little vectors here, which are pure imaginary numbers, essentially, um, then uh, you just measure how much that changes the phase of the thing, and you can work it out. It, it, it boils down to a pretty simple formula, which I won't bore you with. And then you just throw that right at an unwindowed FFT, and you get a really good frequency estimate of the component that you're looking for at any bin of the FFT. Uh, this is how Sigmund and Fiddle, the pitch trackers, work. Okay. So that's a, um, and my, my reason for throwing that in this talk, or to adding that to this talk as an aside, is because that's essentially the same kind of idea of a posteriori windowing, right? and, and using time and frequency both as, as, as things that, that you affect in a window. Are there any questions about all this? Or complaints? <laughs> Everyone's happy, right? All right, okay. Um, I'll, 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 I'm not trying to make you unhappy or anything like that. Um, now, here's an observation. Um, sorry, I'm doing this in the wrong order. That's all right. I'll, I'll, I'll haul out the patches in a second and, and actually make some noise for you. Uh, but before I make some noise, I want to I just mention a thing that, uh, to wonder about, which is this. Um, it turns out that, um, time, you know, for instance, time stretching is hard. Uh, suppose you have, suppose you have a, a short time spectrum scene where frequency is on the vertical axis and time is on the horizontal axis. Things that you can do that you can do well without uh, creating artifacts, for example, are you can do speed change, which means you have half the time and twice the frequency range, or vice versa, twice the time and half the frequency range. Or you can throw a, um, a, dispersion fil a dispersing filter, a filter with dispersion at it, like an all-pass filter, and that will give you different amounts of time lag at different frequencies. Sort of, right? So you can do dispersion, as they call it. Or you can do frequency shifting, which is, you know, you, you get your knob on your little Boda box and, and, and up and down the thing goes, uh, time variably. And that's the thing that you can also do absolutely cleanly. So for some reason, um, area preserving transformations seem to be a thing that, uh, that, uh, that doesn't harass the signal in a way that causes artifacts. Artifacts are caused by things that are not area preserving in some way, like time, stre like time stretching. You, when you do that, you will get artifacts. And this leads to the um, brilliant idea that La Roche and Dolson had, um, I forget when now, uh, in the 90s, uh, about, well, suppose you, uh, suppose you wanted to just um, harmonize a signal, as they call it. Uh, that's a trademark. Uh, suppose you want to pitch shift a signal, right? Well, one thing that you could do is take the signal and divide it into what they call regions of influence, but um, w uh, which I'm imagining are tracks in time, although it doesn't, you don't even need any time continuity at all if you, don't need it, if you don't want it. And then those tracks you can then apply frequency shift to independently. And if you want to, you can even frequency shift them so they cross each other, whatever you want, because when you resynthesize, it's a linear process. So you can superpose that. And then you get um, clean, artifact-free, pitch shifting, <laughs> right, uh, or what looks like it ought to be. At any rate, what you probably get, or what I think you get, is much, is much less artifact-ish uh, pitch shifting than you get if you don't do this. So the trick now is uh, you're, you're doing area-preserving transformations on regions of the, of the, uh, of the spectrum, of the, of the time frequency spectrum. Uh, and uh, but what you're doing is you're opening up spaces between the, 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 the peaks or perhaps even making, making the peaks overlap. And, and that turns out to be a thing that you can work. And a thing that I cannot formulate, but some of you probably can, is this, uh, this, is, a, uh, this is a thing which, which doesn't change the time but changes the frequency. Can you in one step take this exact same process and turn it into a thing that allows you to synthesize freely in time? That's to say a, a time stretcher kind of a thing. Um, I'm sure, obviously you can, but if you want to, but of course the acid test of a time stretcher is can you freeze a signal? And to freeze the signal, you're going to have trouble with La Roche and Dolson because you have to then um, pitch shift it up infinitely high <laughs> and then, and then resample it infinitely slowly back into, time, into the, your own time scale. So you can't actually use the algorithm as written. But there's probably an analytic way to just do those two steps at once that will limit OK when you do that. Or actually, if you go around, if you start going backwards in time, then it gets even worse, right? 
But there's got to be a there's got to be a formula by which you can apply the LaRoche Dolson thing and do it in time instead of in frequency. So someone who needs a master's thesis topic can probably uh, can probably do that in a few months of, of hacking. Okay. I haven't tried it yet. And write me if you're going to do it and tell me not to try it because I'll just wait until you try it. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Oh, yeah, so what I'm going to do now is attempt to run some patches. Um, this is intended to horrify you. Um, this, is, this, is, this is what happens when you, or this is a, a way of thinking about what happens when you, um, uh, when you start messing around with analyzing signals. So let's see. First off, does this thing, ah, it works. Okay, so what, I, what I've got here is a little test bed. It doesn't make any noise or anything like that. Uh, what it does is it, um, it shows you the amplitude and phase of the Fourier transform of a, of a bunch of signals that I'm going to cook up for you. And what I'm going to do is make two sinusoids fight, right? And then you're going to see why this is actually kind of a hard thing to, to, to work through. And this also explains why LaRouche and Dilson actually don't, doesn't work perfectly. So the, um, so, right. So what, what goes on is we're just going to take a nice input buffer. We are going to, oh, right. We're going to Han window it, and then we're going to look at the Han windowed spectrum. Um, this, by the way, is confusing. Okay, so th so the phase, the, the, the amplitudes now. I, I told you that the Han window kernel, you know, points in the wrong way. But what I've done is I've just taken the amplitudes and thrown them at the top, and the phases and thrown them at the bottom. So now, if I take, if I change the phase of the input sinusoid, what you see is there are three phases that, that we're looking at, the three things that light up in the window, and they are half of a cycle away from each other because there's a cycle between the bottom and top of this window, right? Okay. And now if you start changing the frequency, you get this kind of nonsense. Now you're seeing the stuff that's between the bars in the window, um, in the window kernel, I guess you call it. So all I'm going to do is, is, is sweep from the fifth bin to the sixth bin, counting from zero. And, and what you'll see is the um, raw amplitudes become four wide and then eventually become three wide again. So the filter kernel itself, that's to say the Fourier transform of the Han window is actually four, uh, four units wide, but you only see three if you align it perfectly, but in the general case, you see four numbers light up. And you also see a little bit of garbage outside there that is something like minus 33 dB down or something like that, which for my purposes, I usually ignore that because usually there's something a great deal more disturbing than that going on. And, uh, <laughs> But some of you will care about that and have to deal with, you know, Blackman or something. Um, so, um, <coughs> all right. So, so this is sort of what this is just what happens when you Han window a, a sinusoid and, and and mess around with its frequency, right? And then phase again, whatever the phase is, will just change the four phases that you see. And now notice that oh, as as before, they are uh, alternately uh, half a cycle out of phase just because of that horrible thing about zero being at the beginning of the window, time zero being at the beginning of the window, right? Now what we do is we say, well, this is cool. Let's take the window and start to squash it. And then you get this kind of thing. So here's the original Han window. And here's what's happening when I'm squeezing the Han window to, to occupy, say, half of the time window. So the thing got fatter. It should now be, oh, that's, I do not know why it is only six bins wide instead of the eight that I was thinking it should be. Oh, I think maybe these are maybe these numbers are really non-zero now, but my little phase thing—I fixed my phase measurement thing to just not tell you what the phase is when the amplitude is too low, because otherwise the numbers are all jumping around horribly in the in the regions that we don't care about. So, so this this so you see phases sort of pop up as as we as we squeeze the window, you squeeze it a little bit more, and you get you know it's Heisenberg uncertainty problem, right? So the so the window kernel gets fat, and as the as the time thing gets skinny, right? And now what we do is um, we say, oh, what was that? oh, yeah. What about if you, let's, um, let's drop this again. What happens when you sort of slide the window forward or backward in time? Look at that. All that happens is those phases give you do this very funny little dance that is showing you how the 
um, the, the same amplitudes, but the, but the phases now are skewing, and, and it, it really looks like a line getting added, or, sorry, a linear function getting added to the phases as it slides back and forth. But of course, they're wrapping around, so you get this funny effect. Okay, very good. And now, uh, all right, so now it's time to have trouble. So let's get the uh, window to be larger again. And now let's introduce a second sinusoid. And let's get them far away from each other. There we go. So what I'm doing here is, um, oh, yuck. OK, let's get this frequency down to nice. OK, so now what I'm doing is uh, uh, this F2 is the, uh, is the frequency of a second sinusoid that has the same amplitude as the first, although in general they won't. And what I'm doing, and right now it's 475 bins away from the, um, from the frequency of the first one, which is far enough. In fact, if it's bigger than 400, it's far enough that the two window kernels don't uh, overlap. But um, uh, as you probably know, but as I will remind you, the horrible thing is that even if you use like a 2048 window, which, which is a fundamental frequency of about 20 hertz, you cannot resolve two signals that are 20 hertz apart. You need the signals to be 80 hertz apart which is, you know, which you can't always get. And so frequently, 2048 window isn't even big enough to, to do a good, clean, Han-windowed separation of, of sinusoidal components of a sound. And that's, that's the thing that just makes me angry. But, um, <laughs> but I, can't tell you what to, I can't tell you anything to do about it. Um, actually, I can. What you do is you just, um, you just apply it anyway. <laughs> People do this. Um, and I do it, right? So you, you know, twenty forty eight, fine. You can take things down to fifty or forty hertz. What happens is you um, you get a region in. Okay, so so here's the window kernel of the higher frequency one, and I'll now I'll slide them down to like two two bins away from each other, like that. What what what's happening now is the two things are overlapping. We've got a peak here that's you know, a little dirty, but it's but it's only being dirty. Actually, it might be clean. Because this one should be should have hit zero right there, so so imagine those things as being two Han window kernels, each of which has three non-zero points. There there's one point in the middle where the two are fighting with each other, but uh, but the two peaks are still being resolved decently well. Now that only actually worked because the two amplitudes were the same. You might, if, depending on the ampl the relative amplitudes of the two, you might not even see a peak on on, on the side of that other peak. And then you can, well, I can tell you things you could try to do about that. But let's not get into that because it gets fussy. Um, and now, the, the funny thing is, or the, I don't know if you think this is funny. I think this is funny until I get upset. Um, what, what you can now do is, well, what about, the, what about changing the phase of the first one? Now, changing the phase of the first one when the second one isn't there doesn't do anything to the amplitude spectrum, right? But when you have this puppy here, then when you change the phase of the first one, you get a ooh, <laughs> you get a different amplitude in the place where the two overlap, right? You all know this is there, right? And you've probably looked at a nice spectrogram and watched two things beat. But but these things, right? So at 2048, if you're doing that, these two things are sorry, 40 hertz away from each other, which is a long distance. That's you know that's um, a440 to almost to b above it, right? And that's like a high pitched. That's, that's a major second at a high pitch, right? So these are two things that you would like to be able to have simultaneously in the air for musical purposes, uh, 40 hertz, right? But 40 hertz difference does not get you to the point that you can actually uh, deal with these things as nice, clean um, sinusoidal signals. Um, then, of course, what you do is you say, well, that's fine. I will just, um, I'll just peak pick and then treat each one of them as a sinusoid and figure out what those sinusoidal amplitudes and phases should be. And then I'll just forget about the, uh, the actual spectrum and just deal with my sinusoidal reduction of the, of the signal. And that's going to work just fine as long as I'm actually feeding you sinusoids. But if I feed you something noisy, that won't work either. And then you will just not have anything that you can do that's correct. What computer musicians do, or at least what I do, um, and, and most computer musicians who will be honest will probably tell you that they're doing the same thing, is they just pretend that that problem isn't there. And, and, you, just, and you just sort of, uh, you just deal with the fact that, well, you get some kind of artifact, which is, uh, uh, which, which is those signals fighting with each other. 
But that artifact has some sort of phase that's, or so, some sort of amplitude that's different. Depend, you know, it, it's not going to sit there. It's going to sort of beat and so on like that. It's going to get a little bit of beating effect. And then uh, you'll also hear pretty good, uh, pretty good sinusoids too, as, as well as you'll hear this artifact of, of the sort of nonlinear beating effect between them. Right? The nonlinear beating effect will happen when you try to resynthesize this one bad bin. And then the good bins that, that uh, the good bins are are far enough away from the from are, are clean enough that they will actually make nice decent clean sinusoids. Right? And uh, yeah, so let me see if I can make that audible. So let, uh, oh yeah, now I haven't actually checked that these windows don't fight with each other, but let's hope that they don't. Um, so what about all right? Sorry, I'm gonna. S I'm not sure. I'm going to skip forward to the last one of the, OK. So the, um, the, the second, if you download this, the second patch in the series is a correct phase vocoder. And the third one is an incorrect phase vocoder that I sort of fixed to, uh, to, do, the, to do a thing which is, um, which is motivated by what I'm trying to, to explain here. Um, the, and the basic deal is here, supposedly, although I haven't checked, when you whack uh, the number one, it makes a correct phase vocoder. And when you whack the number two, it does something else, which is it measures phase with one window size, and it measures amplitude with a smaller win window size, and then does a resynthesis with the, tighter ampl with the tighter in time amplitude measurements, but the longer in time frequency measurements. Right? The reason for that is because it is actually phase and not frequency that makes you hear frequency when you resynthesize. By which I mean the, the bin that you happen to be in, the, the channel of the FFT that you're in, only controls the frequency that you hear up to plus or minus you know, twice the, um, um, the fundamental frequency of the Fourier transform, which is to say plus or minus 40 hertz, say. And that's not a musically accurate description of pitch. What really sets the pitch of, of a resynthesized frequency domain thing is how the phase compares over time from one window to the next to the next. That's the fine frequency adjustment that, that we care about, right? Uh, so a picture for that is here. My figure zero. Here's a, um, here's a picture of what happens when things are going right in phase. Um, when you, um, and, and again, here what's happening is uh, vertical uh, vertical, it's not axis, whatever you say, the vertical index is uh, frequency or bin number. And the horizontal index is, is uh, sliding your window forward in time. Right? And the assumption here is that there's a hop size, which I'm calling capital H, and there's a sinusoid whose frequency is omega. And notice that you don't actually get, you don't see what omega is at any particular moment in time by looking at phase uh, between channels, which is the vertical uh, axis, if you want. But instead, uh, you, you see it as you, as you slide forward in time. And then, hopefully, if it's a well-behaved sinusoid, what happens is at each moment in time when you apply the window, you see the characteristic phase relationship, which is half a cycle every time you look at an adjacent bin of the Fourier transform, which is arranged vertically in this picture, even though it was horizontal in the, in the time versus frequency pictures. Right? OK. I'm showing you this because um, this if you want to now do something, this looks like a doubly, this looks over constrained. Because for each individual spot in, in this time frequency picture, you're going to, if you want to make something, like synthesize something, you're going to have to choose a phase. I mean, everything has a phase. You've got to choose one. Or, or it's, it's, it, whatever you do, you're choosing a phase, right? But the phase now has to have both a relationship to, say, the phase above it. And it also has to have a relationship to the phase to the left of it, which is the one passed in time. And if either of those things is wrong, your sinusoidal resynthesis is going to be bad in some way. But you can't choose a phase in such a way that, in general, you can't choose a phase in such a way that it has a fixed relationship to the puppy above it and also to the puppy to the left of it. You can't do it. It's, it's doubly, it's over constrained. And in general, there won't be a solution. And you know, you can play minimization games or something, but it's not going it, to. But it's going to sound like Griffin method, Griffin and Lin method, right? No matter what you do. Okay, so that's the so that's the uh, that's the sort of tragedy of, of frequency domain uh, uh, processing and resynthesis. Right? Um, so at any rate, uh, at any rate, even though this doesn't work, right? Uh, computer musicians just do it anyway, and uh, and so you can do it, right? So so you get. Um, 
see what I'm going to I'm going to just make a, I don't know what I'm going to do here. Let's see. Let's make a, this is the, this is the, the problem that everyone hates, which is um, what happens when you have two sinusoids that, uh, that cross each other or perhaps that start at the same place and start beating. So now, what, so what's happening is I'm now doing a Fourier, um, uh, well, I'm now doing a phase vocoder time stretch job on this, on this pair of sinusoids. And it starts out beating. Oh, what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm uh, mousing through the location and time of the resynthesis, which you can just do by hand, right? And everything is cool at the, at the, at the outset when the, when the uh, beating is so slow that each individual window of analysis sort of sees a sinusoid. Everything's cool. The sinusoid gets louder and it gets softer and it gets louder. And, it's, and we're great, right? Later on, when they are four bins apart or more, they are completely resolved and they don't fight with each other at all. And we'll hear two sinusoids and that's going to be great. And then there's going to be a place in the middle where, say, they beat twice within the time window of the Fourier transform. And then the correct way of describing that is we've got two sinusoids and they're beating, but they're beating within the window. And then what do you do? Well, nothing, nothing that you do is going to be right. So uh, let's see what happens when we get there. OK, so start at the beginning. And again, to, um, we can actually just stop at any point we want, right? So, so right, now, uh, right now we're hearing just a sinusoid getting louder and softer. At some point, you get situations where you're just sitting on a fixed point. I'm not actually advancing time at all, but now we've got beating because the, the two sinusoids are fighting with each other inside one window, right? And then you get, depending on the relative phase of the two, which I can change by just moving around, you get different effects. You might get this thing. Can't get it. There. That's, that's a thing. <laughs> and this is a thing, but those are not the same thing. <laughs> and then, oh yeah, and then, and then they got resolved at the end. Okay. Um, actually, no, they didn't. Something's wrong here. Well, I'm not going to worry about it. Oh, why is my length only? I wanted 5,000 samples. I have to, oh, come on. And now, okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm recording it again, right? And now we'll see if we got it. Yeah, there we go. Strangeness. And then by the time we get to a you know, minor third or so, we finally got these things untangled from each other, and now we've got a clean result again. But there's all this dirtiness in the middle where we just don't know, and it doesn't know what to do about the fact that those two sinusoids are living in the same bins, right? Well, I claim that you can at least, I'm going to stop. Uh, well, I, I claim that you can at least improve this a little bit by um, telling the thing to make amplitudes that are only uh, half as, as um, that are only the amplitude of what it was in the middle of the window, which means the frequency is, is spread out more, but phase still d determined from the whole window. And then you're not going to hear a whole bunch of difference, but you'll hear a little bit better stuff going on. Still having trouble. But it's a lot more believable than it was when I just did the straight fa Oh, sorry. I'll make it a little louder. That, I claim, is at least substantially better than this was. But that is a very tentative partial result. And so what I would incite you all to do is go fool with this and see what you can get and see if you can do something that's actually better than the, than the standard phase vocoder when you're trying to resynthesize things on different time scales. And then if you can do that, you can do all sorts of other stuff. That, but that's sort of the good test problem because you can, decide, you can decide whether it's doing it correctly or not in some sense. All right, and it's time for me to stop. So. Um, if uh, you know everyone's going to get coffee in like four minutes, but someone ask a question. <laughs> Thanks, Noah. So, uh, are there questions?
Anyone for questions? Oh. Thank you much, very interesting. Do you have any advice for those of us who by accident of fortune also wear the hat of engineer and our FFTs hop by 50% instead of one sample at a time? Oh, the hop size here is actually window over eight. So it's an overlap of eight. Um, but, I, but actually, La Roche and Dolson uh, in their original paper did do a 50% uh, hop size. Um, it's a lot more work. It's a lot more conceptual work to get things working at hop 50%. Uh, and, I, and it's worth doing if you're doing, say, data reduction or something like that. But if you're doing computer music, it's cool to just go ahead and have hop 1 over 8. Um, and, but that's a, that, that's a run around, right? The, th the thing is, most of what I'm doing doesn't actually work when you, when you stretch the hop out that far. Because when you try to compare phases of, of the signal with that grade of hop, there's, um, uh, there, there's a wraparound possibility, or there's an ambiguity in the possible frequency. So what you want is for that Han window kernel to hold only one possible frequency that, that we could be looking at, uh, depending on the phase difference. And if the, if the hop is too big, then the various possible frequencies that could correspond to a single phase change are more closely spaced than the Han window kernel. And then you really stub your toe bad. So uh, you can still do things as long as you don't do anything that really changes the signal, like just you know reconstruct it or something. But it's hard to do musical stuff with it until you really push the hop size way down to like window over eight or something. Thanks. I used to say window over four, but now I'm doing window over eight. <laughs> Um, f first of all, uh, thanks for reminding me what an awesome teaching tool PD is. Um, I'm going to be using it this quarter uh, to do these kinds of live demos. Um, the, uh, your remark about using the advancing phase to estimate frequency, um, you know, there's this classic paper by Reif and Burston that, that the mm. optimal uh, detect frequency detector for peaks is the uh, peak amplitude. Of the yes. Yeah. So how could it be better? It seems like it could be at best equivalent. If, right, if, if the situation is sinusoid in noise, it turns out that you, if I'm remembering correctly, and this is 20 years ago, uh, it turns out that the hop one thing actually gets the same Cremier Rao bound that, that Reif and Bornstein got. Um, the thing that's interesting is not when you have sinusoid in noise, which is not a musical situation typically, but when you have a sinusoid fighting with another sinusoid, how well can you reject the interference from a nearby peak. And there, I believe, the two methods give diverging answers. Uh, but it doesn't turn out that, that looking for the, for the highest point does terribly well when you have a fighting peak, because the, the, because the side lobes of, of some other peak will push that peak forward and backward kind of badly. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, what I do want to know is, um, so you got, you got the peak picking thing, and you've got the phase thing, and maybe. And maybe in some ways they're equivalent in some kinds of situations. I'm not sure. Uh, are they equivalent, first off, maybe? And anyway, uh, if they're not, then couldn't you just combine them to get an even better estimate? Like take some kind of smart weighted average? I don't know. And I would like to know the answer to that. So that's, that's a totally unsatisfactory answer. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> It's a nice beginning of a discussion. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And maybe a paper will come out of it. Um, <laughs> right. But yeah, yeah um, the maximum likelihood approach is you, you, if you assume there are two sinusoids, then you basically uh, have a two sinusoid model and you just try all frequency separations and relative phases until you nail it. You know, it's the brute right. force match. And uh, that would be the standard maximum likelihood answer. Um, right. And, and, and that's going to be amplitude and phase. Right. But that makes such a strong assumption of the nature of the signal that you're looking at that I don't know, even if this thing doesn't actually do maximum likelihood, doesn't, you know, doesn't make the Cremier Rao bound or anything like that, maybe it actually works better anyway in real situations. Who knows? I mean, there's no model. The thing, <laughs> I mean, you, you just got this stuff that's coming out of, of some instrument or something. And all that stuff, oh, I'm going to, it's sinusoid and noise. That's, it's, such, it's, so, it's so wrong that I don't even know, I, I don't even read those papers. 
I guess I well, did they, once. A they, referee they had a second them. paper on two sinusoids. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the other thing. It's it's so depressing to. But, but they assumed re they were resolved. Right, right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or rather, they showed that when they weren't resolved, then suddenly, thing goes haywire. Yeah. It didn't work. Yeah. Right. That's right. No longer. And this goes. The good thing is, when this goes haywire, all that happens is something funny comes out of the speakers. It's not that your plane crashes or something like their because they they were working on they were working on radar, right? So <laughs> there's more serious business than what we're in here, or less serious. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, if there are no more questions, I'm going to suggest we go for coffee. There's a poster session. I have to remind. I've, I've, I've actually remembered to tell you that there is a poster Sweet. session, uh, but I'm sure you can chat to Miller if you're into all this stuff that goes over my head uh, <laughs> during the coffee break. Okay. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. Yeah.